okay, where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? I mean, let's get a little closer. You can take a look at people right over here. Right over here. No, okay. All right. There we go. You say hello? All right. You good? Can I let you go? All right. Happy New Year. And welcome back to Just Chatting. And this is the series of videos we do on Thursday and Sunday evenings just for our own entertainment. Well, Nutmeg and the Ginger Sock Puppet have been quiet recently. Um, no dust-ups, no attention grabs. In part, of course, that's due to the fact that their Netflix autohagiography just aired. And frankly, I think the reviews are in. It's safe to say it was not well received. And Harry's book is due out in a week and a half. So this is just the lull between storms. I thought we would take advantage of this because I've mentioned this in previous videos. I have a whole stack of topics I would really love to get into, but they never give you a minute's peace. It's always something new. So all of these juicy little topics have had to go on the back burner. But given the fact that we're in a quiet time right now, I thought I would throw one of them out to you. And this is Nutmeg and Wallace. So we're going to take a look at the similarities, the differences, and why I think the British should be holding a Wallace Simpson Day when we come back. Although I'm not serious about the British holding a day in recognition of Wallace Simpson, I will tell you, I think in light of Nutmeg's impact on what's going on, the, uh, the chaos she is bringing with her, I think Wallace was probably very much the lesser of the two evils. So, Let's talk about who they were, what the similarities are, and what the differences are, because that is telling a whole tale for us. Um, I'm going to start with Nutmeg, and we're going to start with her background. Most of us are pretty familiar with this at this point, because there have been many books uh, that have come out about this. Uh, the first one I ever read was Lady Colin Campbell's book, I don't have it here with me. It's it's actually in my bedroom. I was reading portions of it again. Uh, I actually have post-its marking passages in that. It was very informative and very interesting. Tom Bauer, of course, Revenge. Uh, then there's the autohagiography, Finding Freedom, that Nutmeg wrote herself with apparently minimal assistance from Omid Scobie and Carolyn Durand. And we now have the newest installment of autohagiographies in that bizarre little six-part Netflix series, so we know a lot about it. By the same token, there's a lot that is not commonly known. So let me start with uh, Nutmeg's background. Now, Nutmeg, I, and I have said before, frankly, that she is half a step from the trailer park, and that's not really true. She's a step and a half from the trailer park, and obviously I have no idea what her, her ancestors' housing was. But what I can say is we know about Doria's background and we know about Thomas Markle's background. And both of them came from respectable but working class families. They did not come from money, affluence, or even solid middle class 
we're looking at sort of lower middle class backgrounds. Uh, this probably goes a long way toward explaining why Doria, when she met Thomas, had no education, no, no job skills. She was just sort of wandering between temporary and part-time gigs. Thomas, on the other hand, comes from a family of three boys, uh, his two brothers, all of whom did well. So despite the fact that his family was not affluent, they certainly instilled a, a strong work ethic in their kids. Thomas uh, distinguished himself as a lighting director and a cinematographer in Hollywood. Uh, Mike went to work for the State Department, very respectable job. Um, well, it's a little beyond respectable. It's uh, working for the State Department is actually a desirable job. This is, this is someone who can safely say he made it and grabbed his piece of the American dream. The third son, Frederick, uh, now known as Demos, has often been portrayed as uh, a crackpot and a religious fanatic. Uh, he's an interesting guy. I'm just going to very quickly throw this in because, well, you'll see when I get there. Uh, Frederick had a religious conversion, uh, changed his name to Demos, became uh, ordained in the Eastern Orthodox Church, and became uh, an ascetic holy man. This seems sort of, you know, crackpot religious fanatic. Uh, people have said he runs a cult. That's not true. The Eastern Orthodox Church is a, a, an ancient and respectable religion. Thank you very much. It's not a cult. It's mainstream. There was a time when it was one of the most mainstream religions on the planet. And Demos now is living a lifestyle that wouldn't have raised eyebrows 500 years ago. But in the 21st century, a religious ascetic is, seems out of place in time. And I think that's where this nonsense of him being a cultist and a religious lunatic comes from. I think it's a great tragedy that Nutmeg never introduced him to Prince Philip because Philip's mother, Alice, was, well, she had the same career trajectory in her own life. Uh, she had a conversion. She converted to the Eastern Orthodox faith and eventually became a nun, lived in poverty, took care of the poor and the ill. I think Philip could have looked at Demas and seen his mother's life story there. And if Demas and Alice had been in a position to have met, I'm quite certain they would have gotten along like two peas in a pod, because in fact, they were the same peas in the same pod. So we can't say Demas is a crackpot and a fanatic unless we say the same about Alice, and Alice was not. Now, let's just say that. She was not. I consider her to be a great, great woman. So, that was Thomas's background. Solid middle class, three sons who were raised well enough to ensure that they would have good lives as adults. Doria's family um, was very much the same thing. We're, we're talking about people who were not particularly affluent. It is said that Doria's stepfather had an antique store. No, I'm afraid it was more along the lines of a secondhand or thrift store, which is, you know, down a few notches from an antique store. That, I think, is a nice little spin people put on it. I do not believe that owning a thrift store is in any way disreputable. Uh, I, it's just not it doesn't have the same cachet as being an antique dealer or an antiquarian. So I think they sort of gloss that up a little. So Doria and Thomas were both born into lower middle class families. Thomas managed to work his way into solid middle class 
And in fact, he was very well paid at his job. So that's what we have on Nutmeg's side. That's where she came from. These are the people and the values uh, that, that shaped her life. Wallace, on the other hand, was born in 1896. So she was, she was born a Victorian into a family. Of, um, it was a marriage between two very wealthy and socially prominent Baltimore families. This was the upper echelon of Maryland society when Baltimore was still um, a, a city to be reckoned with. She, however, was born into the poor branch of those families, and her father died when she was only five months old, leaving her mother a widow with no money, a five-month-old baby, and Wallace was raised for the early part of her life, first eight years or so, going from the home of one relative to another, essentially on the charity of wealthier relatives. When she was eight, her mother made a respectable second marriage, and that gave the little family some independence and uh, some income of their own rather than just living off the largesse of the rest of the family. However, because the family was wealthy, they did make a point of taking care of little Wallace and she was educated in the most expensive girls' school in Baltimore. Justice Thomas made sure that Nutmeg was educated in the most expensive girls' school in Hollywood. Differences being Hollywood in the 1980s and 90s and Baltimore at the turn of the century. Values and the the social inculcation was very, very different. Nevertheless, they both benefited from good educations, the kind of educations that were available to, to young women who would have been on a much sounder financial footing than either of them. Interesting, and that may well play in for both of them in what happens later. So let's move on to uh, personal issues. In this case, Nutmeg and Wallace are 180 degrees apart. Nutmeg is a relatively attractive woman. She was certainly a relatively attractive girl when she was younger. Uh, I now I know we've seen pictures of her without makeup and we've seen pictures of her prior to the plastic surgery. And yeah, she definitely enhanced whatever she had naturally. Options Wallace did not have because of the time. Wallace was not a beautiful woman. I hate to say this, but frankly, I find her rather homely. She, there was just nothing beautiful about her. Uh, however, she had incredible personal style. She could carry a, an outfit like a runway model. All of her friends, uh, dating back from her childhood, said the same thing, that Wallace was always immaculately dressed, very stylish, um, and they said other things too. She was at the head of her class, they said she was extremely bright, she, and they liked her. Um, Nutmeg was never described as stylish or immaculately dressed. And I think, I think the comparison there is really, really obvious. One of them got the looks, the other got the style. Um, and in equal proportion, frankly, because Nutmeg's style is the equivalent of Wallace's lantern jaw. Good heavens. So there's our, our major difference. Now I mentioned Wallace's friends because we've got another difference here too. And this one is worth looking at. 
Wallace made friends early in life. She was a respected member of her community. She went to church. She was confirmed. She, she made friends at school and she kept those friends throughout most of her life. Uh, she, she was a loyal friend to them. They were loyal friends to her. Very different story with Nutmeg, who she discards her friends the way I discard my socks. She really does. Um, this is, it, what it does is it shows us two totally different personality types. One that is devoted to their friends and their friends are devoted to them in return. And another for whom friends are, well, friendship in general is transactional it's something you, you have in your life now and trade it in when a better model comes along. Very different in that regard. As for prior relationships outside of the realm of friendship, Nutmeg had many prior relationships. As she was married to Trevor, she had live-in relationships. Apparently she had live-in relationships as far back as college. Wallace was married twice. Now in Wallace's era, you couldn't openly live with a man you weren't married to without risking serious social sanction. Uh, not that nobody did it because people always did things like this. It wasn't as if back a hundred years ago, Nobody had a sex drive. No, people did, they did things. It's just that it wasn't uh, the social norm to do it. Wallace has been accused of having had many, many affairs in her lifetime, but there is scant evidence of any of this and none of these rumors surfaced prior to her involvement with Edward. And that alone tells a tale, because it's very likely that because of her involvement in Edward, she was targeted um, you know, with gossip, rumors, and frankly, probably lies. Uh, Nutmeg, now, she got around, and I, even though when she tells her life story, she just erases that part. As far as she's concerned, she was as innocent as a spring morning when she married Harry. No, it's definitely not true. By the time those two women got involved with the royal family, they had each been around the block a time or two. And that was one of the things that the British media picked up on fairly early on with Nutmeg. And of course, since the British media did not deal with Wallace at all until, well, almost until the abdication, uh, these things were not sort of bandied about prior to uh, the engagements. Then we have to deal with the, uh, the popularity and public image of these women. And Wallace had no public image prior to her involvement with Edward. She had no widespread popularity or lack thereof because she wasn't known. No one, no one knew who she was. She was just Mrs. Simpson who traveled in the same circles as the Prince of Wales. That was all there was to it. She did not have that sort of, I want to be an influencer thing that Nutmeg had going. But when the British public first became aware of her, She was haunted by death threats immediately. She went into hiding. She was like public enemy number one. The British people absolutely despised her. 
she was vilified in the press. There were, there were no positive images of Wallace Simpson out there once the public found out that she was involved with the Prince of Wales. None. Nutmeg, on the other hand, was received very well. Uh, she was quite popular in whatever small amounts of negative press she got. Now, for her, that's huge because she doesn't want any negative press at all. The overwhelming majority of her press coverage was extremely positive, both here in the U.S. and over there in the U.K. There's no question but that the public and the press had not turned on her the moment she showed her face on their doorstep. No. Wallace, yes. It was sudden, it was immediate, and it was over the top. People hated her. Um, and that goes to the next issue that I want to deal with, which is their relationship with the royal family. The reason people hated Wallace was she was an overt threat to the royal family. But in fact, she never saw herself as such. And nobody realistically saw her as such. Nobody within the royal family, within the British government, nobody who was remotely well informed saw her as a threat. Because Wallace Simpson was married and she had previously been divorced. She was an Episcopalian. She was, she was raised in that faith, as I mentioned before, a regular churchgoer. And that is the American version of the Church of England. Uh, she could no more have married Edward than she could have sprouted wings and flown to the moon. She never expected marriage. She never wanted marriage. It, to say she never expected it, frankly, that's such an understatement because it was a sheer impossibility. It was undoubtedly something she never even thought about. Now, I know that someone has reported um, that she said on the death of George V, oh goody, now I get to be queen. If she said that, it was clearly a joke. It was certainly not something anyone ever expected to happen because no British monarch had ever voluntarily abdicated, ever. There were some so-called abdications, but in fact, those monarchs were deposed. I don't think it's abdication if someone's holding a sword to your throat when you do it. No, those were not voluntary abdications. It, it was just unthinkable. No one at the time expected that to happen. So did she have designs on the royal family? Absolutely not. It, it just... We look at it in hindsight and say, well, look what happened. However, if we put ourselves in Wallace's position at the time, it, it was an absurdity. It was something that just couldn't possibly happen. All she wanted was the social connections and the, the social status that she got from being the Prince of Wales mistress. She liked the money because uh, he gave her money and she liked the jewels because he gave her jewels and she liked the business opportunities that flowed to her husband, therefore flowing to her in terms of uh, her husband's improved financial situation would benefit her. This was in the days when very few women were their own breadwinners. That's all she wanted. She wanted to go home to her husband and, you know, hang out with the Prince of Wales on weekends. It was all that really mattered to her. 
she did not have designs on the royal family. Nutmeg, on the other hand, was determined to marry into the family. Her object was matrimony from day one. Well, actually, day minus, oh goodness, I'm thinking the royal grift has a really impressive timetable on this, and I believe she she has information indicating that Nutmeg set her sights on Harry at least a full year, maybe two, before she even met him. Uh, and frankly, I find the royal grift is more right than wrong on these issues. So Nutmeg went in with the agenda of marrying into the royal family. Wallace went in with the security of knowing she would never have to do that. She would not have to give up her husband. She would not have to give up her independence. She would, she would have it all. Wallace wanted to have her cake and eat it too. But her cake was not tied up in becoming Queen of England or Duchess of Windsor. It was just to be the Prince of Wales' mistress. That's all. So they had very different attitudes about the royal family. Their goals were diametrically opposed. Wallace not only didn't expect marriage, marriage was problematic for her. Marriage was something she was actively seeking to avoid. If she had been interested in marriage, she would have divorced Simpson much earlier on in her relationship with Edward, but she did not. She had no desire to marry Edward and her actions. And of course, we've got plenty of letters that have been recently uncovered that support this, but her actions at the time show that she had made no effort to free herself of the marriage she was presently involved in, in order to be eligible to marry him in the first place. Not her goal. She did not want to live in Buckingham Palace. She just wanted the country parties. She wanted the diamonds. She wanted the money. That's all. Nutmeg, of course, wanted the ring. Very different goals. Interestingly enough, because now we get to the end of, of the comparison and we're looking at impact. Wallace is considered to have had a great impact on the royal family. Edward abdicated the throne for her. That's a huge impact. The problem is Edward never wanted to be king. And if it hadn't been Wallace, it would have been something else or someone else. The man was in no way temperamentally suited to the job, and it wasn't a job he wanted. He liked being Prince of Wales. He liked having the money and the status and the women, and not any of the responsibility. He would have been deliriously happy to have remained Prince of Wales for the rest of his life. Again, we can see that clearly from his behavior. Wallace was the excuse for Edward abdicating. She wasn't the reason. That's all there is to it. He would have done it one way or another. And I know none of us have a crystal ball. And it's very hard to make these predictions. But I do think everything we know about Edward before and after after the abdication tells us this is a man who had no interest in government, no interest in ruling, no interest in doing the work that was involved in any of this. He just, he enjoyed the status, but that was the end of it. He did not want to pay the price. Now we look at the impact of nutmeg 
is having. At the moment, it looks very big. At the moment, she is rattling cages left and right. Um, I just did a video last week. She is saying things, and it's this race baiting that is actually presenting a real threat to the cohesiveness of the Commonwealth of Nations. Yeah, that's looking pretty big right now. Is she going to have the same impact Wallace had? No, not, not very likely. In fact, Wallace's impact, and as I say, it's an impact that's attributed to her, not an impact that she really owns in her own right. Nutmeg, no. She has already been sidelined. Harry's been sidelined. It's pretty much over for them. They can kick up a fuss and write their memoirs. By the way, there are rumors now that Nutmeg is going to write her memoir after Harry's memoir. It's like, good Lord, these people just cannot get enough of themselves. And clearly, she's not through speaking her truth, using her voice, it's a remarkable amount of chatter for someone who contends they were not allowed to speak. But that's what's next on the agenda. By the time that happens, is anyone going to be interested? I very much doubt it. I really do. I think we have all heard everything we want to hear from those two. And I think most of us know that any stories nutmeg puts out in an autobiography are going to be just that stories they're going to be it's going to be a work of fiction it's not going to be the truth it's going to be her truth and her truth has been proven time and time again to be patently false uh, before we go though i did want to share with you rumors are coming out about the content of harry's memoir and apparently it's not targeted at Charles quite so much as it is targeted at William. Personally, let's say something controversial here. Personally, I think that this is a good thing. I think once Harry's venting of his spleen about his brother is made public, I think the whole world is going to be able to see him for who and what he is, which is a, a man-child who is jealous of his brother and driven by that jealousy. If, in fact, he is still determined to, well, I can't even say to fight out his battles with his brother, because there's no fight. William's not fighting back. If he is determined to continually attack his brother, you know, like kick him in the shins and run away. People are not going to be interested in hearing this. And I think that's pretty much a, a positive thing. I think, in fact, what we are seeing right now, what we're in the middle of, is Nutmeg and Ginger overplaying their hand. And I've been waiting for this for a long time. Most of the people who comment about Nutmeg and Ginger have been saying, this is coming. They are going to implode. They are going to overplay their hand. They are going to take things too far. But very soon, their drive to be the beloved center of attention of the universe is going to prove to be their downfall. And I think that may be what we have coming up in a week. All right, so back to my original point. Why should the British be much more grateful to Wallace? Well, in the long run, folks, she did you a lot less harm. She never had designs on your monarchy. She never did anything to harm the Commonwealth. She, she basically went home and shut up. Once she and Edward were married, they were off 
in the quiet little social circles of, of France, of Jamaica, of wherever they showed up. Uh, New York, um, my great aunt. I, oh, gosh, I should, have, I should have led with this. My great aunt knew Wallace Simpson. She did not know her well, but they traveled in social circles that overlapped because, of course, they were both Americans. They were both born at the same time. They both came from comfortable families and traveled in those circles. My great aunt met her on at least three or four occasions. And she said that the first time she met Wallace, she thought she was a very unattractive woman and she could not possibly understand what the Prince of Wales saw in her. By the second or third time, she had completely forgotten that Wallace was not attractive and saw her as remarkably elegant and charming. And she also said that even though she and Wallace met briefly on a few different occasions, every time she was with Wallace subsequent to the first meeting, Wallace remembered her name and would often mention details from previous conversations they had. And that goes back to what I started off saying. Wallace had lifelong friends. Her friends adored her. And my great aunt, who was more of a casual acquaintance than a friend, was a tremendous supporter of this woman because she liked her. She said Wallace was intelligent. She was witty. She was a really gracious, gracious hostess, and she never saw her do an unkind thing to anyone, although anyone who saw her with Edward would dispute that, but she said she never saw her do an unkind thing to anyone. So that was Wallace. I wonder if Nutmeg could find anyone in her life who would make the same claim. All right, that was something I've wanted to throw out because similarities, differences, and in fact, the key differences, which is what they wanted from their interaction with the royal family, I think is probably the most important thing to take away from this. Wallace only wanted the jewels, the parties, whatever. Nutmeg wanted to go in and sink her claws into the family. And we're seeing the results now. All right, I hope you all had a fabulous New Year's Eve. Whatever celebrations you do, I hope they were wonderful. And we will take a look at a slideshow on the way out, and I will see you all next time. Have a terrific week. Thank you.